on the thing. Yeah, got it. What elevator for me? No, he just said he was having elevator trouble. Okay, so you got this? <laughs> I can just do okay. sit there. I think you don't really need to. Okay, it's good. Fine, I can. Yeah. You probably have to speak loudly because uh, there's no mic. Okay. So, so the plan for today is that uh, we continue with barrier methods and we will see how to use uh, primal dual methods to solve linear programs. It's a general approach that you can later use for more general programs. Problems. So this approach later on Tuesday we will use to solve semi-definite problems as well and you can also use for uh, quadratic uh, problems as well. So let's quickly review what we learned last time. So we introduced the barrier problem. The original problem was to minima, uh, minimize the function f over the set s. And we introduced this barrier function b, which was uh, continuous, non-negative. And as you approached the boundary of the set, the boundary function diverged to infinity. The, then the barrier method, or barrier problem, was defined as this, that you have C1, C2, CK, CK plus 1, and so on, increasing numbers that diverge to infinity. And in each step, say so step K, you want to solve this minimization problem, f of x plus 1 over CK dx, where again, B is the barrier function. We denoted this function together with R, so this is R, C, K at the point X. And we also introduced this notation that 1 over C, K plus mu K. And then we stated these four lemmas that as you proceed with this barrier program, so K increases from K to K plus 1, then this function R is decreasing the value of the barrier function is uh, decreasing, the function value is uh, decreasing, and as you do this iteration, then through a decreasing se sequence, you are converging to x star, the solution of your original problem. And we didn't prove these four elements, but as you can see, they are very simple. The same steps as we did for the penalty methods. We have the same similar four lemmas. You have to use similar arguments to prove that. Then we discussed how to use um, primal logarithmic barrier methods for solving LP. And the idea was that, that the primal problem was defined by this, minimize C transpose x, where we have these linear constraints and x is non-negative, so this is the standard form of LP. And we introduced the log barrier um, function over the set that x is non-negative. Um, so this is how we define that function. And we also discussed that <coughs> usually if you have equality constraints, then it might be very tricky to introduce log barrier function for those constraints. If you have inequalities, then it's easier. So we have inequality constraint for this variable, we introduce log barrier function for this variable, but we just use the Lagrange multiplier for this constraint here. So we define this new function f, we calculate its derivative with respect to x. Uh, that's, that was this term here, c minus mu dx inverse e, where dx is a diagonal matrix formed from vector x. Uh, this is the inverse of that, and e 
is just the all one vector. Okay, this term will be important in this lecture, so you should remember this. <coughs> we also calculated the second derivative as well, which was just mu times um, dx to the minus two matrix. Right, and after that, so we have this function f. What we did that we used the second order Taylor expression of this function f. It's a quadratic problem with linear constraints, and uh, so we have this quadratic constraint, uh, quadratic function with linear constraints, and uh, then we just use um, Lagrange multipliers uh, to minimize this quadratic function. So we had this quadratic function for Lagrange multipliers we introduced pi and just added this to our objective and our new task now is to calculate the derivative of this with respect to x and solve this problem. So this was the Lagrange problem. Um, we calculated its derivative with respect to x. Um, now we have a linear problem, and we re rewrote this constraint to this equation here. And for we also had that a times pi x is uh, zero. So what we did is that uh, if we were in x an x bar point, then our new point x will be x bar plus delta x, and we solve this system for delta x. Right, this is what we did uh, last time. And we got a linear system and we solved it. So one lesson here is, um, if you have a, so uh, the approach can be more general. So if you have a quadratic function with linear constraints, then you can, again, just use this uh, Tucker conditions and you will get a linear system that you can solve. Okay, and we <coughs> stopped here. Um, we just tried to sketch this algorithm. So we have a C transpose X cos function where C is the gradient of uh, this line. Uh, this is our domain defined by AX equals B um, equation. And the algorithm starts from a point, say from this point, and we decrease mu to converge to zero, and here I'm just plotting, let's say, that when mu is 10, then we are in this uh, solution, so that's the solution of uh, um, this problem we just, in the previous slide, we just show how to calculate this minimum point. Uh, say I decrease mu from 10 to 9, then I would be in this point, and so on, and at the end we would converge to the optimal solution. And here these dashed lines are just the level sets of this function phi, which was the logarithm, log barrier function of these constraints. So another lesson here was that even though the optimum was not in an interior of the set, we could still use log barrier function. So this is where we stopped last time. Any question about this? Yes? Um, in the previous slide, you had primal quadrivariate problems. So is it dual one, you first take the dual problem and then do the Right, so there are, there are, this is called primal of the real problem. We just consider the primal. There's a dual version where you take the dual first and you repeat the same thing. And now what we are going to do, we discuss the primal dual local real problem where you use both the primal and dual. Okay, so that's uh, our plan for uh, now. So any other question with this? So then let's move on. <coughs>
we will need primal and dual forms of linear systems. Both of them are called uh, symmetric dual forms. Okay? And in this case, what would happen with the duality gap? So which is smaller, which is bigger? Ax is um, 
not bigger than b. X is an n-dimensional vector. So this is the primal. And the dual is minimum y transpose b over y subject to y transpose a. So this is asymmetric. That's why it's written as c transpose and y is non negative. So you can see what's the difference between uh, symmetric and asymmetric dualities, right? So in symmetric case, we have inequalities here, inequality here. In the asymmetric case, we have inequality here, but we have equality here. And sometimes this is also, you can rewrite this, that Instead of this, I could just say that a, I could introduce a select variable, ax plus b. Oops, that's. Whereas b, where s is non negative. Okay, and for duality get, what we would get is b transpose by dual objective minus the primary objective, c transpose x. B is AX plus S, so it's AX plus S transposed by minus C transpose is Y transpose A from the dual. So Y transpose A times X, which is S transpose Y. S is non negative, Y is non negative, so this is non negative. Okay, and there's an other asymmetric form. You might find some times where we want to minimize C transpose X subject to AX equals B. X is non-negative, that's the primal. The dual is maximum Y transpose G. Subject to Y transpose G. Right? And in this case, for the other gap, so in this case, you would introduce a slack variable here, right? The y transpose a plus s. C transpose, so yes, transpose. Um, and then if you do the same calculation here that what you did uh, in the previous case, you will get that this is S transpose X, which is non-negative. Okay? Questions? So it's just important to know that there are these primal dual forms of linear programs. It can be symmetric or asymmetric. Uh, 
and uh, we want that calculating the derivative of uh, this new cost function. It was you remember I told you that remember this quantity here because it was the important one of x, and this was the x inverse e, where again x is a x is a vector, dx is a diagonal matrix formed from the vector x, and we need the inverse, and e is is the overall one. Okay, so we want to minimize this, and we use the first order, um, or the um, stationary the condition of the local area problem which says that the derivative so I to mention, we have for um, ax equals d right? so we use uh, this one, we want to minimize c transpose x such that ax equals d x is non negative so then we want to minimize six transpose x such that subject to ax equals b, x is not negative. So the kick, the first manifestation right, and the condition of uh, says that the derivative of f of x with respect to x plus some Lagrange multiplier by transpose the uh, derivative with respect to x, our constraints, which I just write b minus ax, right? So b minus ax is uh, zero. And then, on the stationary conditions, we have that this should be zero. We already calculated that this is c minus mu d x minus e. And What is this? This is just minus a, right? So this is zero, and we get that c minus mu dx inverse e um, If I make mistakes, you can just call me. Right, that's the first order stationarity condition that we get for this problem. Question? It should be very simple so far. Okay, so. <coughs> what we just said, c minus mu d x inverse c plus a transpose by uh, To simplify our life, let me denote this expression with s. So what we have is that mu dx inverse e is s, or I could also say that 1 over mu So S is a vector, and um, I can just write that I make a diagonal matrix from vector S. I denote that to be S, and then S vector is D S uh, times E. So I can follow this bit. One over mu D X D S E. So we 
get this from uh, for this S, we get this from the first order uh, stationary condition. So you, you should please remember this. Okay, but we have other KKT conditions as well. So for our constraints, we had that A X equals B. X is um, non-negative. Because we use log barrier function, we also we will start from an interior point, so x will be um, uh, strictly positive. And the other constraint comes from this that c minus s is a transpose by. So one more thing that we can observe that S was defined as mu times dx inverse E. Um, X is positive, E is positive, mu is positive. So we can al we also know that um, um, S is not negative for sure. Right. Okay. So so far we did nothing. Just uh, played a little bit of KKT conditions, and now we can prove. This lemma is x by s. These three variables, they are in solution of this. Then we can prove that x is feasible of the primary problem. Why S is feasible for the dual? And the duality gap X transpose S. We, do you remember we already Calculated the duality gap S transpose X. So what's that? Um, I can rewrite X transpose X, X transpose S in this form that the all one vector transpose B X diagonal from X, B S diagonal from S times E. And now if you look at this KKT condition here, we have the dx ds E. It's mu times E. So what we have is it's mu times E transpose E. What's this expression if uh, x is n dimensional? It's mu times n. So what you can see that th this is very nice. So we have the this is the duality gap, and we know that the duality gap um, in these solutions will be um, will depend on this mu the parameter of the log barrier function. So as mu goes to zero, the duality gap x transpose s we we'll converge to zero, and then when the duality gets zero, we are happy. Any question? Thank you.
Right, so let me rewrite again um, the KKT conditions. So we have KX equals T, X. It's positive. Um, A transpose Y plus S equals C. And this was our search condition. OK, so we want to find Y, X, and S. And we have this system. Everything is linear here except this last equation. If uh, it was a linear in X and S, then we would be, it, our life would be very easy. We just solve a linear system. We find X, S, and Y. Um, we will know that for that X, Y, and S, this will be our duality gap. Um, but this is uh, nonlinear. And because of this, we cannot solve this system exactly. We will have a, we will approximate the system. We will have a solution of that system. But here we will suffer some error. And uh, that error that we will have Okay, let me just, oops. I just write this with S. So dx um, S minus, this is our error, right? And let me assume for now that uh, this is smaller than some number beta. And um, this is called the beta approximation of the stationary condition. OK, this is just a term for that. Let me just rewrite this here. So what we are going to do, <coughs> so we have this system. We want to solve this system. At some point, we have this error beta. Um, we solve this system. We will get new parameters. And then we will see how this beta is going to uh, converge to 0. And we can also see how the duality gap is uh, converging to 0. So I have a nonlinear system we want to solve. Um, what's a good way to solve that? So you have a nonlinear system. We want to find solution for x, s, and y. Any ideas? So it's a continuous system, right? You have a nonlinear system. I want to find solution for x, x, s, and y. Right, so you could do gradient descent. I want something faster. Right, um, even faster? Newton, so let's do Newton, okay? <laughs> After the break. So, if in the break you write the solutions, then we can just keep that. OK, but that's uh, the strategy. We will have Newton method for this update. And we will do this up update. And then we will be done. And we can even study the convergence rate of the algorithm that we get. And you remember when we had the ellipsoid method, what was the convergence rate that we proved there? So if you have n uh, variables and um, m constraints, that was n plus m to the fourth. And I told you that what we proved, it's not optimal, because you could uh, um, get a convergence rate that's n plus m to the uh, 3.5, right, three, uh, three and a half. Now we will have a Newton method, 
and what's the convergence rate of the Newton method? Right, so it's quadratic, right? So that's what we, how we create it. So for Newton method, we will have, uh, but it's local. So we can prove that if you are close to this, then with quadratic double exponential speed, you could do method, our convergence rate was global convergence rate. Any point, um, you would converge with that rate. But with here, if you are close to the solution, you are faster than that. Okay, so now you can finish calculating the Newton updates and we continue. I was just joking, leave your seats. <laughs> Let's continue. Who solved these equations? So. Then let's do it together. So again, high level ideas, what we do here. We had, uh, we want to solve, we want to find solution of linear programs. Linear programs has primal and dual forms and uh, we wrote the Karushkun-Tucker conditions. We know that uh, the solutions has to s have to satisfy the Karushkun-Tucker conditions. It turned out that those Karushkun-Tucker conditions are nonlinear. That's a nonlinear system. We want to solve that nonlinear system, and we use Newton approximation for that. High-level ideas are clear. So even if you get lost somewhere in the details, but what we want to do, is it clear enough? Right, so <clears throat> say we, so we, we are looking for parameters x bar, y bar, and so x, we are looking for parameters x, y, and s, and say we are in, we already have some x bar, y bar, s bar, feasible but not optimal solutions. Right. Um, So from the Karushkun Tucker um, conditions, we know that A x bar is B, x bar is bigger than zero. So I just rewrite the Karushkun Tucker conditions that we already discussed. A transpose y bar plus s bar is C, where s bar is positive. And for the stationary conditions, we have d, one over mu dx bar, d s bar e minus e, this is zero. So again, everything is linear except this expression here, which is nonlinear. And what happens after update? After update from x bar, we move to, say, x bar plus delta x. From y bar, we move to y bar plus delta y, and say from s bar we move to s bar plus delta s, right? So for these updated points, we have a times x bar plus delta x equals b. A transposed, so I want the updated points, right? to satisfy these Karushkun-Tucker conditions as well. everything was simple so far. The only problem we have is here in this nonlinear system. So first term, one over mu. So this is a di diagonal matrix where x bar, it's made from x bar vector. 
and I update now x bar with delta x. So this updated diagonal matrix, I can just rewrite this. That's the original diagonal matrix plus a diagonal matrix with the update delta x, right? And I can do the same for um, s as well. So it's d s bar plus the diagonal matrix with delta s, right? So this is a diagonal matrix made of delta s um, vector, e minus e. And now we just need to compare this system and this system and see what we get for delta x and uh, delta y. So from, and delta s. So from this equation and this equation, what, what do we have for delta x? So if you subtract the first equation from this, a times delta x, this is zero. So let's do the same thing here. Subtract this from this. A transpose, someone can continue, delta y. plus delta s, zero, right? And I want to do the same thing here as well. So subtract uh, this from this. So that's a bit uglier, but we can do it. So I must uh, this with me, this equation. Then I get this, right? And x bar, so this times this d delta s times e plus this d delta x times this d s bar times e. This is this mu e minus uh, what left we have left d x bar d s bar e and minus this and this okay so I just um, multiplied everyone with everyone and we want to solve this for um, delta S and delta X. So this is uh, delta S. Um, this is, I don't have enough space, but This is d s bar times what? Delta x, very good, delta x. So now we have, so this is linear in d s and delta x except this term, right? So what do we do? everything right I want to solve this whole system in delta x 
delta s, delta y. It's linear in delta s here, delta x here. I have only this term here that's not linear. Right, so we just neglect it, right? If something causes us problems, we forget about it. Right, we can do that because, um, I mean, the idea is that delta x, so we update the, so delta x and delta s small, so they are second order terms and they are usually small. Okay, but now we have a linear system. So we can solve that for delta x, delta s, delta y, and that will be our update. We write the system we, we got. So A times delta x zero, A transposed delta y plus delta s equals zero, and D as bar delta x. Okay, so it's a simple linear system and you solve it and you got the update delta x, delta y, and delta s. So, So can you see what the final algorithm is now? So we, have a, we start from a, we have a feasible solution that's not optimal. You calculate, uh, right, that feasible solution is say, x bar, s bar, and y bar. You write this system, solve it, you update where you were, and you decrease mu and you do this system again. So now the question is how to decrease mu with what rate, and no one knows what's uh, the optimal for that, so people use heuristic, like let the next step, let this mu be, um, say in k, at step k plus one, let it be alpha times mu k, where alpha is between zero and one. Right. Right. So So the good thing about this, we, I didn't tell you all the details, but you can prove that under some conditions it cannot happen. Uh, so if those conditions don't hold, then you need to do something extra, like cut back, get rid of the negative parts. But you can, you can prove, uh, you remember I was talking about this beta approximation. You can prove if in that beta approximation, that beta is small enough, so if you are close to the global optimum, close enough, then, um, after this update, your solution will be still, uh, still feasible. But it would take another 10 minutes to prove that, so I don't want to do that now. Does it explain, right? Right, so there are a couple of other details I we didn't discuss. Question? Right, so this can be one update rule for me. Another update is that you remember what the duality gap was in terms of x and s? It was x, so say if we are in x prime and um, s prime, then the duality gap was x prime, x prime transposed s bar. And um, so this was at, oops. So we had this, um, Actually, we had this equation that 
mu times n was this expression. So let me divide both sides by n. So mu is x bar transpose s bar n. And what you do is, let's say in k plus 1, so the next mu, let it be the duali this duality gap, say over 1 over 10. So in the next step, your goal is to s decrease, to set the new duality gap to 1 over 10, so where you were. And that's your new mu. But it's again, it's kind of heuristic, right? So in each step, you want to decrease your duality gap. You want to make it to be 1 tenth where you were. Right? Um, so we just, I don't write the pseudocode of the algorithm now. It would take some time, but you will see. Yeah? Right. So it means I'm like right hand side of the third equation is zero because x bar s bar is a standard point, is a feasible point. Mm. So which one? I so in the current situation, you have the third condition. Right. Uh, so if you just plug that into the like, third equation for the next slide, then that would be zero. The x bar, the x bar. Right, but the, this is the thing that we didn't solve that exactly because it's a nonlinear constraint. So this is indeed, if you have an optimal solution, mm -hmm. it should be. But we are just approximating things. So it's. That's your goal, indeed, to solve this, but we can never solve that. So that's why it won't be zero, although that's your goal to set it up to zero. Right, so we linearize that equation and we solve the linear version of that. Okay. Right, so I think this was the most complicated algorithm that we discussed so far. But uh, this is one of the most efficient algorithms to solve uh, linear programs. So that's why I thought it's good to tell the details. The high-level ideas are simple. You set, write up the Karushkun-Taker conditions, you will get a nonlinear system, and you try to solve that. And the nice thing that you can even prove things about that. So again, you could prove. Um, Um, so in the slides, I will state it formally, but now I just tell you the high-level ideas. If you are close enough to the optimal solution, then uh, then your convergence rate using this algorithm will be quadratic. So you are will converge fast to the optimal solution. Okay, but I would like to move on and start discussing semi-definite programs, which is the topic for this lecture. Um, but if you have other questions, I'm happy to discuss them. Yes? No, you can actually prove that it will be quadratic. The, uh, right, so, so if you are close to the global optimum, uh, then it will uh, be, you will converge to the global optimum with quadratic. That, that depends on how you update mu, right? Right, so with some uh, setup, yes. Right? So there are many details we didn't discuss, but it would take a couple of lectures to discuss all the details. And this is one of the simplest problems, right? Linear pro program. So for more complicated algorithms, you will get more compli complicated updates. But at least you should see the ideas, what 
to be arguing here. Other questions? So let's move on to, so no more questions? So let's start discussing semi-definite programs. This is also a huge topic. So we could just talk a whole semester about this. And the algorithms usually are more complicated than what we just discussed. So I, it's better not to give into all the details, I think. But I still want to talk a little bit about this problem because it's very useful in, in many uh, problems. So at least I want to define, so show some applications, and discuss high-level ideas how to solve semi-definite programs. If you are interested in the details of this, these are very good introductions, these papers. Um, I especially like Lobas. Uh, Last of Lovas uh, introduction uh, to semi-definite programs, um, but the others are, are great too. So we will need, <coughs> before we proceed, we will need a few definition, few definitions. So let S N. denote the set of symmetric matrices. And let Sn plus be the set of positive semi-definite matrices. So those symmetric matrices where x is uh, positive semi-definite. And we will need a few properties of PSD matrices um, later. So one important property is that the set of PSD matrices, they form a closed convex what? Cone, right? Um, the proof is one line, so I skip it. And I think we might have done it, right? Right, so. And a uh, few properties that we will need, that if X is a symmetric matrix, then I can rewrite this in this form, Q D Q transpose, where Q is orthonormal, B is diagonal. Okay, if X is positive semi-definite matrix, then in this QDQ transpose form, um, the di diagonal elements, they are non-negative. 
if x is positive semi-definite and say its diagonal is zero for some i, so then what can I say about x? So you have a positive semi-definite matrix. One of its diagonal element is zero. Any guess? You can guess. So I want to say something about the elements of X. Like, for example, what can I say about XIJ? So XII is uh, zero. What can I say about XIJ? or and j elements. So I can say that this is xjii, right? because it's a matrix, but. <laughs> <laughs> right, so it will be 0. So. Um, the proofs for, right, so. If you don't know this, then uh, try to prove it. It's a good exercise. OK, so if x, if I rewrite this x matrix in this form, and x is positive definite, then uh, what can I say about matrix A? Right, so it's positive definite. And I define this guy too. I heard some sure, right? So it, this is called sure complement. And what can I say about this? So this will be positive definite too. OK? So you really should know these properties. So let's introduce an inner product between matrices. So say I have. Um, a and B. How, what would be a good inner, inner product? Trace? What? I, I couldn't hear. Uh, so say, no, but let me use another notation. So A and B are, um, say, N by n matrices. So let it be defined by this. OK, it's just how, so what's the inner product between vectors? You multiply apply the coordinates and sum. And we do the same here for matrices. OK, so is it, have you ever seen something like this? Right. Um, I could also say that this is the trace of what? A transpose B. Good. Right, so here is a question. If A is PSD, B is PSD, what can I say about the inner product? It's a number, but good. It's not negative. So you were right. OK, and here is a theorem. So let A be PSD, B is PSD. 
I'm interested when this inner product is zero. Any guess? So many times we like P as the matrices because you can really think of that, that as real numbers. So if matrices usually are not behave like real numbers, but P as the matrices, in some sense, they do. Not that close to real numbers, but almost. So their product, at least, is zero. OK, so if you have uh, A and B, P as the matrices, their inner product is zero, then the standard matrix product will be zero. So. So after this, we can define, so I just defined the inner product. Um, so I want to define semi-definite programs. And just to remember, linear programs were defined as minimum C transpose x subject to for some vectors AI, AI transpose X equals BI. We have M of these constraints, and X is non negative. So I want to generalize this to matrices. So let, instead of C vector, let C be a matrix. Let X be a matrix as well. So what, what would be a good cost function that generalizes this C transpose X? With C and X? Right, so we just introduced this in our product. And I do the same here, that for each of these, I replace these in our product with something like this. Oops. And how should I replace this x? Right, x is p or c. OK, so this is called semi-definite program. So it really looks like LP, right? Uh, but now x being non-negative vector, x is a p as the matrix. So we will have dual problems for this one as well. So we, you, you remember for LP, we had minimum C transpose X subject to AX equals B. X is non-negative. That was the primal. The dual was maximum Y transpose B in Y and S, where Y transpose A plus S select variable well, C, S is non-negative. That was the dual problem. And for duality gap, we discussed that C transpose X minus B transpose Y. That was S transpose X, which is non-negative. We defined the SDP as minimum linear product between C and X subject to This inner product equals bi. Um, X is PSB. And the dual will be defined what you would guess from this dual of the standard LP. So it's denoted by semi-definite dual. So it's semi-definite program, but this P is used for primal as well. So it's so the dual of semi-definite programs is we will maximize y is uh, still a vector. 
but this S, this will be a n by n matrix. And our cost function is the same as before, y transpose beam, v is a vector. And we replace this guy. Um, so we generalize this to matrices. So we have that S, here we had that S is non-negative. So we will have that this S, we define the same way. It's matrix C minus. So what would be the generalization of this y transpose A? Just this, and this is PSD. Okay, so now we know what semi definite program is, what its dual is. We don't know how to solve it, and we don't know why we care. So we will discuss these questions next Tuesday. If you have questions, so you might get lost in the details of these calculations, then please come to my office hour, and I'm happy to explain the details there.